chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, long COVID, mast cell activation, POTS, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, neurodivergence. What links all of these disorders together? The answer might surprise you, but it's a key aspect that's often overlooked in the management of these conditions. And that aspect is the brain. Now this does not mean that the symptoms related to all of these conditions are in the patient's mind. Not at all. This is a medical condition. So before we go into the detailed video, I want to highlight that this particular condition isn't a typical psychiatry condition, but that does not mean that psychiatrists don't play an important role, particularly neuropsychiatrists, because you see advances in psychiatry now have led to the emergence of fields such as psychoneuroimmunology, psychoneuroendocrinology. And by understanding the impact of medical conditions and how it affects the brain, we can make a significant difference to patients by working together with different medical specialists. So before we jump into the video, keep this aspect in mind. I'm Sunil Rege, consultant psychiatrist. Today I'll be talking about chronic fatigue syndrome, CFS, and myalgic encephalomyelitis, ME. Now we've done a video on CFS and ME on this channel, and we've got a number of comments, uh, really insightful comments about the condition. Based on that, I'm gonna be talking about really drilling down into some of the pathophysiology of CFS and ME, because there are certain aspects in the treatment that sometimes aren't taken into account. And what I mean by that is that CFS and ME really highlights this mind or brain body divide. And what happens is most of the treatment focuses on the periphery, really almost as if there is a cutoff at this level. And a lot of treatments focus on the peripheral aspects and really the brain, which is affected to a great extent, is forgotten. And the important thing here to recognize is firstly, it is an extremely heterogeneous disorder. So the things I'm going to be talking about, it's really important that they should be considered as general educational aspects, really derive some insights or as a way of discussion. It's really important that it's not taken as medical advice because what I talk about generally can't be applied to all patients with CFS or ME. It is an extremely heterogeneous disorder and it's important to take that aspect into account. But some of these aspects may actually help sort of enhance that discussion with treatment providers. So with that in mind, let's jump into this further discussion. What I'm going to be focusing on firstly is a big question, you know, why should I listen to a psychiatrist in the first place about CFS and ME? Now as psychiatrists, we often get this quite a lot. Most of the patients I see with CFS and ME have actually gone through treatment, average I would say eight to 10 years, extensive treatments, and then finally sort of seeing a psychiatrist, often because they start to say have developed mood disorders or other issues. Now, of course, many a time they've been told it's in your head, which is really a comment that is derogatory because CFS ME has real, real biological underpinnings. But a psychiatrist can play a very, very important role in the management of this condition. The second aspect I'm going to be talking about is endothelial dysfunction and how it affects perfusion. Perfusion both to the brain and of course the periphery as well, which of course we know leads to a number of symptoms. I'll be talking about the pathophysiology of the autonomic nervous system and POTS and then enter mast cells because we do know there are subsets sets of mast cell activation and chronic fatigue syndrome. Then I'll sort of be bringing this together and be talking about important neurotransmitters such as dopamine, noradrenaline, and then linking that to the brain. And then talking about how sort of that treatment that's focused in the periphery needs to be augmented with treatment that also looks after the brain. So with that, let's start off with the first aspect. You know, why a psychiatrist? The thing about psychiatry is that psychiatry is not just about the mind. It deals with the brain. So we have fields such as psychoneuroendocrinology, psychooncology, psychoneuroimmunology, and chronic fatigue syndrome really encompasses the brain and the body together. It just cannot be separated. And that's the reason why having a psychiatrist, preferably with a interest in psychoneuroimmunology, psychoneuroendocrinology, consultation liaison psychiatry, someone that can take an overarching view across all the systems will be an important part of the team. But once I go through these mechanisms, I'm hoping that you'll be slightly more convinced as well with the role of a neuropsychiatrist or a psychiatrist in that overall management. So first, let's look at what we know about CFS and ME from a perfusion perspective. Now we know when we look at cerebral blood flow and the perfusion in organs, chronic fatigue syndrome patients are known to have reduced cerebral blood flow and what we call orthostatic intolerance. And I'll talk about more about that when we come to autonomic nervous system and POTS. Now, this abnormal cerebral 
blood flow and orthostatic intolerance is associated with abnormal vascular regulation. And as a result of that, we know that both the cerebral aspects are affected leading to a number of symptoms, but also the skeletal muscles are affected. And these skeletal muscle pH abnormalities are known to be associated with autonomic dysfunctions. So firstly, we do know there is good evidence for endothelial dysfunction in chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, this is postulated to be an important mechanism by which there is a shift from the vasodilatation aspect that is necessary, uh, particularly to counteract just constant sympathetic activity because sympathetic activity is associated with vasoconstriction. We need adequate parasympathetic activity to also facilitate vasodilatation. So it's really a balance between these two aspects. But what happens in chronic fatigue syndrome is that these aspects are impaired, leading to a predominant alpha-1 adrenergic activation, which means a balance towards vasoconstriction in the skeletal muscle and brain. And excessive vasoconstriction would actually reduce perfusion overall, both in the periphery and the brain. So that's the important thing to take into account. Secondly, we know that excessive vasoconstriction, particularly when it leads to consistent hypertension, for example, leads to impairment of vascular resistance. The endothelium actually gets affected. Now, this can be compounded in certain individuals that may have, say, hypermobility syndrome, Ehlers-Danos syndrome, for example, connective tissue disorders, which is a common trait in individuals with chronic fatigue syndrome. This has been talked about as this endothelial leak, which compounds the situation. Furthermore, in certain subsets of patients, they have found beta-2 adrenergic receptor antibodies and M3 acetylcholine receptor antibodies, which, of course, when there are antibodies to these major vasodilator components, what we see is, again, a shift towards vasoconstriction. So what we're seeing is that there is a shift towards vasoconstriction, which can reduce perfusion across organs. Now, if you think about the impact of this hypoperfusion, this is where tests such as CPET, the cardiopulmonary exercise test that many individuals with uh, CFS will, will go through. It's a measure of uh, the energy production, you know, from contributions from metabolic aspects, respiratory aspects, cardiac aspects, etc. right? And we also know this links to the mitochondrial aspects. We know there is abnormalities in mitochondrial energy production in patients with CFS. So you can see how all of these aspects are converging and one of the hypotheses is this endothelial dysfunction. Now I know a lot of these things are quite complex. You know, I'm sort of providing this and trying to simplify it as best as I can, but please do use the comment section to enhance some of this discussion as well. So with antibodies to the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, which is necessary for vasodilatation, and the M3 acetylcholine receptor, we are looking predominantly at vasoconstriction, which can lead to reduced perfusion. So that's an important aspect to take into account. Next, we know when cerebral blood flow is impacted, symptoms such as mental fatigue and cognitive issues such as brain fog can occur, which can be compounded by all of these. Okay, so that's the first thing, which is the endothelial dysfunction. Next aspect is the autonomic nervous system and POTS. And the reason I'm talking about autonomic nervous system and endothelial dysfunction is because we're starting off, we're moving away from psychiatry and we're looking at sort of the peripheral aspects, the kind of aspects that many patients will relate to and say, you know what, this is something I can completely relate to. But I will come later to show you how this is closely linked to the brain. So that's where I'm sort of heading just to give you a guide. So let's look at the autonomic nervous system and POTS next. Now you see the autonomic nervous system, there is a crosstalk between the sympathetic and parasympathetic reflexes. And the aim of that is to maintain adequate perfusion to the brain, the cerebral blood flow. Because you see when there are changes, say when we are lying down and we suddenly get up, we need this to shift really quickly so that there is a sympathetic shift to maintain that perfusion to the brain. So this is known as orthostatic tolerance. Orthostatic tolerance is a measure of the ability to prevent hypotension during gravitational stress. Best example is getting up suddenly from bed. And if there's impaired orthostatic tolerance, then individuals can be really prone to these hypotensive episodes that in extreme cases leads to the phenomenon that is known as POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. Now, uh, POTS, the core component is orthostatic tolerance, but POTS is defined specifically by a heart rate increment of 30 beats per minute or more within 10 minutes of standing up or a head tilt. And this is a test often done by cardiologists to diagnose that in the absence of orthostatic hypotension. So I'll go through this again. POTS is defined by a heart rate increase of 30 beats per minute or more within 10 minutes of standing or head tilt in the absence, the head up tilt in the absence of orthostatic hypotension. The standing heart rate is often 120 beats per minute or 
higher. So this is that orthostatic tachycardia that occurs. Now, ME and CFS is associated with POTS, which manifests with symptoms of cerebral hypoperfusion and excessive sympathetic activation because the body's really trying to maintain that perfusion to the brain. Now, the thing about orthostatic intolerance is that it may really make patients bed bound. I've seen patients wheelchair bound as a result. I had a patient that would have hemiplegic migraines I'm on that shift. These are transient ischemic attacks, but this clearly shows that there is a significant dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system, POTS, which of course affecting cerebral blood flow. So you can see that the autonomic nervous system is closely linked to cerebral blood flow as well. Upright posture results in orthostatic stress and even in the absence of heart rate and blood pressure changes is known to be closely associated with post-exertional malaise, which is we know a core feature of chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, an interesting thing is present. You might remember that I just talked about this beta-2 adrenergic receptor dysfunction because in some patients there is this subset with antibodies. Now, you see when there is this suspected dysfunction of the beta-2 adrenergic receptors, what happens is something known as chronotropic incompetence, which means that the heart rate may not even rise proportionally to the sympathetic activity. So there is this sympathetic activity, excessive activity, but the heart rate might not rise proportionally. So if we take only the heart rate as a measure of sympathetic activity, we might actually be missing the possibility that orthostatic stress and intolerance is present, that the phenomenon of POTS is still present as a contributor to post-exertional malaise and other mental symptoms such as brain fog, cognitive symptoms, etc. if we just focus on the heart rate. So this is an important thing to take into account. So to summarize, essentially what's happening is orthostatic intolerance in POTS results in this impaired sympathetic vasoconstriction. That leads to venous pooling. Venous pooling leads further to hypovolemia and a hyperadrenergic state as a compensatory mechanism. So really it's a vicious cycle. We have hypovolemia in many cases, the body, there's a hypovolemia leading to orthostatic stress. Orthostatic stress will, of course, lead to sympathetic excitation to maintain blood flow to the brain. So therefore, that results in excessive hyperadrenergic activity. And that excessive sympathetic hyperadrenergic activity is an important part that we will see feeds into many of these symptoms and affects the brain overall. Now, so if you're interested in learning more about these conditions, don't forget to check out the Academy by Psych scene. We've got a webinar series, a three episode webinar series, totaling seven and a half hours that covers chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, long COVID, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, POTS, mast cell activation, the role of neurodivergence. And we bring it all together and we highlight for medical professionals how we can actually implement these strategies by using real life case studies. For a single annual subscription, you not only get access to these three episodes, but you also get access to a range of other accredited courses because we cannot split chronic fatigue syndrome of fibromyalgia and long COVID from all of the other aspects that we need to learn. For example, we've got a webinar series on ADHD, which is again seven and a half hours. So by linking the two, understanding the neuroscience and the advanced psychopharmacology, we can make connections and improve outcomes for patients. So don't forget to check out academy.psychscene.com. So let's jump back to the video. So once again, to summarize, autonomic nervous system, POTS, excessive sympathetic excitation, a central hyperadrenergic state. Next, there are two types of POTS, the postural orthostatic tachycardic syndrome. The first one is the neuropathic POTS, which is known as dysautonomy, which is due to dysautonomy. And the second one is the central hyperadrenergic POTS. Now, a subgroup of patients, the first one I'll cover, which is the neuropathic POTS, these patients have indirect evidence of peripheral sympathetic denervation innovation in the lower limbs. And we know that take, for example, in certain hypermobility syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, there is some evidence of arterial wall stiffness, small fiber neuropathy. So this small fiber neuropathy may be playing a part here. And this condition is often characterized by, you know, loss of sweating in the feet, for example. So this peripheral sympathetic denervation is linked to this neuropathic pot. Why is it important? Because it's important when we think about medications, such as, you know, when we talk on mitodrine and beta blockers and pyridostigmine, etc., which are the common ones prescribed. So do keep this mechanism in mind when we come to that later on. Now, the primary pathophysiological mechanism of postural intolerance in this subgroup of patients is presumed to be impaired peripheral vasoconstriction leading to pooling in the lower limbs. And this is why sometimes we see phenomenon such as one limb may be sort of almost a levido present there, redness are present there, or swelling of the feet, the other limb not present. So we often see this on physical examination as well. The second aspect is the central hyperadrenergic pots. Many 
patients with POTS have elevated levels of norepinephrine or noradrenaline. And this is, of course, suggestive of a hyperadrenergic state. And this is due to hypovolemia, as I talked about. Hypovolemia, orthostatic stress, bang a compensatory mechanism, hyperadrenergic state, sympathetic excitation to maintain that blood flow. The thing here, this group of individuals will have extremely high levels of upright plasma norepinephrine. There is a certain subgroup in addition to this. Furthermore, a specific genetic abnormality has been identified with hyperadrenergic POTS, whereby they have a single point mutation leading to loss of function in the norepinephrine transporter. So we know that norepinephrine transporter, you might look at the video that we've done on SNRIs, which is serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. These are common antidepressants prescribed, but we know they're evidence-based in say fibromyalgia as well. And we know that they inhibit the norepinephrine transporter, which means they increase levels of noradrenaline present. Now in this individuals with the subset of POTS, central hyperadrenergic, there is a loss of function of the norepinephrine transporter. What happens there is there will be excess noradrenaline present leading to hyperadrenergic state because the norepinephrine transporter, the function is to take norepinephrine from the synaptic cleft and take it into the presynaptic neuron to avoid excess norepinephrine there. So when there is a loss of function, there is excess norepinephrine. So to summarize, two types of POTS, we have the neuropathic POTS, peripheral vasoconstriction abnormalities, and the central hyperadrenergic POTS due to hypovolemia, compensatory, excessive norepinephrine, noradrenaline, leading to excessive sympathetic activity. So this is a really important part. Now, how does this link to endothelial dysfunction? You see, the thing about endothelium is that the endothelium has innervation from the noradrenergic pathway, which is for vasoconstriction, and also acetylcholine innervation, which is the parasympathetic pathway to balance this excessive sympathetic activity. So that's how norepinephrine plays an important part in that overall endothelian sort of dysfunction as well. Next, enter mast cells. So just to recap, I know there's quite a bit to take in. Just to recap what we've looked at. Firstly, we've looked at the endothelial dysfunction, which links to perfusion abnormalities, brain and periphery. Next, we looked at autonomic nervous system. Autonomic nervous system could be peripheral autonomic abnormalities or the central uh, hyperadrenergic state as well. Overall, the pathophysiology is all around orthostatic intolerance. But then I also talked about how the autonomic nervous system has that link to the endothelium as well due to noradrenergic innervation and also due to the acetylcholine innervation. Next, enter mast cells. Now, what are mast cells? Mast cells are the first responders of the immune system and they're omnipresent in the body everywhere. They're localized in the peripheral nervous system and within the brain. So they play a very, very important role, you know, with neurons and with neuronal processes throughout the body. Next, they're also in close proximity to blood vessels and peripheral nerves and therefore strategically positioned to modulate the sympathetic activity, vascular tone, and also angiogenesis, the production of, you know, capillaries, uh, vessels, etc. So what we can see here is mast cells. They are in close connection to the stuff that we've already discussed, which is endothelium and the autonomic nervous system through the peripheral nerves. Furthermore, mast cells also contain dopamine. And we will talk more about dopamine because this is a crucial piece of the puzzle in chronic fatigue. Syndrome. Now you see mast cell activation is known to be present in a subset of individuals with CFS and ME. And mast cell activation actually causes dopamine depletion. So it reduces dopamine overall in the body and of course the brain as well. And interestingly, studies have found that when you target the dopamine 1 receptor, there's the dopamine receptors are D1 to D5. When you target the dopamine 1 receptor on mast cells, this can actually inhibit mast cell degranulation. Of course, inhibition of mast cell degranulation means that dopamine levels don't decrease and and the other vasodilator components aren't present. There's no mast cell activation. So these are promising approaches for the treatment. Now, mast cells we know release histamine. Histamine is a powerful vasodilator. So what's happening when there's cutaneous vasodilatation that occurs with mast cell activation, we get flushing. So when can one suspect mast cell activation syndrome? Usually when patients have POTS and they have flushing, suspect mast cell activation. You see what happens here is that when there is release of these vasoactive dilators, such as histamine, this may contribute to vasodilatation. There's a reflex sympathetic activation then. Sympathetic activation resulting in central volume contraction. Central volume contraction along with norepinephrine release and then orthostatic intolerance. So this is a feedback loop that has been proposed. So basically there is a specific subset of patients with mast cell activation and chronic hyperadrenergic orthostatic intolerance of POTS present. The issue here is beta blockers actually trigger mast cell degranulation and worsen symptoms. So it's an important one to take into account because we we know that beta blockers are often prescribed to reduce the heart rate in patients with POTS or chronic fatigue syndrome, etc. 
Now in this subset of patients, the antihistamines may be more beneficial. Next, just to recap very quickly, endothelial dysfunction, autonomic nervous system, POTS, mast cells, and now let's look at dopamine as the fourth aspect. Why is dopamine important? Often we think about dopamine predominantly when we just think about pleasure, reward. Take for example, lots of discussion on dopamine with addiction, etc. So that's where we think about a dopamine in the brain. But dopamine is a really important neurotransmitter and not just a neurotransmitter, it has other functions on the endothelium in maintaining cerebral blood flow. We know also plays an important role in the control of autonomic nervous system through the prefrontal cortex. So this is what I'm going to be talking about in more detail. So first let's look at cerebral blood vessels and dopamine. Dopamine has a direct effect on cerebral blood vessels and is plays an important role in the control of cerebral blood flow. And this is from the 1998 paper by Kimmer published in Nature. The close association between dopaminergic terminals and cerebral blood vessels raises the possibility that disturbances in central dopaminergic neurotransmission could alter cerebral vascular regulation. For example, cerebral blood flow and its regulation are abnormal in schizophrenia, depression, and Parkinsonism, diseases in which there is dysfunction of dopaminergic pathways. The important thing is not only as a neurotransmitter, we know that it's re responsible for a number of functions, particularly in the frontal lobe, which is a uh, hedonic drive, attention, concentration, cognitive aspects, executive function, decision-making, etc. But it also plays an important role in blood flow. So this is a really, really important point here. And studies that have been done with amphetamine exposure have shown that there were both vascular and microvascular responses to amphetamine, increasing cerebral blood flow, as well as reducing the diffusion distance for oxygen, which means that it increases perfusion, the oxygen intake, the ability, the uptake of oxygen. So to kind of summarize the impact of dopamine on endothelium, because we know endothelial dysfunction is a core component of chronic fatigue syndrome, right? So it is not only a precursor in the production of adrenaline and noradrenaline. You see dopamine is broken down by dopamine beta hydroxylase to noradrenaline. We've talked about noradrenaline a bit, right? So it not only helps in the production of noradrenaline and adrenaline, but it is also an important vasodilator. And interestingly, you see there is an endogenous source of dopamine in the vascular wall. So what studies have shown is that the arterial wall of systemic vessels, that is the endothelial cells, and the underlying tissue produces a substantial pool of dopamine. And this intrinsic release of dopamine happens upon stimulation by decreasing oxygen concentrations, which causes a dilatation of the blood vessel, thereby increasing blood flow and subsequent oxygenation of the tissue. This is a really, really important point. Dopamine is endogenously released from the arterial system itself in response to hyperperfusion. So it's an intrinsic vasodilator. And you can see what happens if there is an overall reduction of dopamine in the body. So the second aspect, and we'll come to those aspects and see whether there is a reduction of dopamine in chronic fatigue syndrome. So firstly, we looked at dopamine in the endothelial aspects. Second, let's look at the prefrontal cortex dopamine and whether the prefrontal cortex actually affects the autonomic nervous system. You see the connections of the prefrontal cortex areas are with the hypothalamic areas and the prefrontal cortex can actually influence autonomic and endocrine responses that accompany many emotional processes. And the part of the brain that's been identified is a medial prefrontal cortex where there are projections from the medial prefrontal cortex directly to the sympathetic and parasympathetic brain centers. And therefore actually the prefrontal cortex controls many of these autonomic responses. So the second aspect of the prefrontal cortex that we need to take into account. And how is it linked to dopamine? You see the prefrontal cortex really functions on dopamine. The striatal, the striatum has projections to the frontal lobe. This is the frontal striatal pathway. It's all about dopamine. So you can imagine if there's reduced dopamine in this pathway, the control on the autonomic nervous system is also affected. Next, dopamine plays an important role in pain. You see dopamine activity has been found to be attenuated in fibromyalgia. We know there's a close relationship between chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia often coexist. CSF levels of dopamine and presynaptic dopamine function are reduced. We know that inactivation of dopamine D2 receptors leads to excessive pain sensation, hyperalgesia. So overall, sort of summarize it, if we have adequate dopamine, our pain threshold as well is adequate that we will not have hyperalgesia or excessive perception of pain. It's really, really important here. So the big question, is dopamine affected in chronic fatigue syndrome? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Firstly, through inflammation. You see, in the brain, dopamine is produced in two key areas, the substantia nigra, part of the brain that's really affected in Parkinson's disease, and the ventral tegmental area. And take, for example, there is a dopamine imbalance hypothesis that contributes to fatigue in MS, multiple sclerosis. Similar aspect plays a part in chronic fatigue syndrome. You see, in inflammation, two key things happen. One, there is a decrease of the 
the VMAT, a vesicular monoamine transporter. This is the important transporter that packages dopamine into the vesicles for later release into the synaptic cleft. So it decreases that, those levels of the transporter. Secondly, it actually will increase the expression of DAT and DAT takes up dopamine from the synaptic cleft into the presynaptic neuron. So there isn't enough dopamine available in the synaptic cleft. So overall, what you get is depletion of dopamine. And we know depletion of dopamine in the prefrontal cortex is going to lead to not only mood issues, but it's also going to lead to anhedonia, co significant cognitive issues, brain fog. But we've just talked about dopamine also playing an important role in perfusion. It's going to lead to decreased cerebral perfusion as well. We also looked at dopamine uh, controlling autonomic nervous system. So imagine dopamine, the front, the medial prefrontal cortex is not really able to control those excessive autonomic sympathetic drive arising from the autonomic nervous system as well. So we've got a decrease in that and the rest of the body is, you know, there's excessive sympathetic activation, all these autonomic nervous system symptoms, orthostatic intolerance, etc. And the frontal lobe is struggling to fix that. So we can see that the dopamine overall is reduced in inflammation. The second aspect, we talked about mast cells. Dopamine is reduced due in mast cell activation and mast cells essentially contain dopamine. The other curious aspect when it comes to risk factors, you see ADHD is a known risk factor for chronic fatigue syndrome. In fact, many patients that I see when I take their history have been really, really high functioning sometimes, really go-getters, go, go, go. In terms of personality, when a history is taken often, there are a number of traits that look like ADHD. They probably never had a formal diagnosis of ADHD, but ADHD is really prefrontal cortex, dopamine, noradrenaline dysfunction. And I've done a video on ADHD, so you can have a listen to that, to that to understand more. But individuals with ADHD have a greater risk of chronic fatigue syndrome. And particularly females with ADHD can have an increased risk of chronic fatigue syndrome. So here, hormonal aspects also come into play. And we know estrogen is closely linked to dopamine as well. So here, there's an extra complex relationship that we can see with prefrontal cortex, dopamine, noradrenaline, and we know that the hyperarousal symptoms are quite prominent in ADHD that manifests as hyperactivity. And in females, we have this cognitive and emotional arousal where, where mood swings, etc., can occur. And that's also because the frontal lobe cannot control that emotional arousal system. So again, really, really fascinating aspects. So bringing it together, I'll really simplify it. What we can see here is, remember that we've talked about endothelial dysfunction, autonomic nervous system. But the point that I'm really trying to convey is that the periphery is looked at, autonomic nervous system, endothelium is looked at from a perfusion perspective, POTS, etc. Mitochondrial aspects are looked at because etc. You know, see pets, etc. But what about the brain? We've just talked about the role of medial frontal cortex in controlling the autonomic nervous system. We just talked about dopamine, which is such an important neurotransmitter, playing an important role in the brain. And we can't afford to forget that. The second aspect is this central hyperadrenergic state that occurs, orthostatic intolerance. You see, it's a central hyperadrenergic state. How do we reduce that central hyperadrenergic state? So we've got to understand what is the connection from the periphery peripheral hyperadrenergic state to that central. What part of the brain controls that? And we'll talk about that in a bit. Now, what's often used? Often when patients are referred or I've seen them, and I've mentioned, you know, most of the times I'll see patients after an extended period, they've had treatment for eight to 10 years. Mitodrine is commonly used. It's a peripheral alpha-1 agonist, which leads to vasoconstriction. Now, evidence suggests that it is most useful in individuals with that neuropathic POTS. That's where it's most helpful, but it does not really pass the blood-brain barrier. So what about all the cerebral perfusion aspects that are required to be maintained in the brain. Second, beta adrenergic blockers are commonly used in cardiology clinics to control tachycardia, which we know is present in POTS. But it can be associated with side effects such as excessive fatigue or some people just have intolerance. You know, nightmares can increase and sleep disturbances are a common issue in um, CFS as well. So reducing the heart rate, by the way, can be counterproductive if the increase in heart rate is meant to be a compensatory mechanism, but could be useful if the tachycardia was overcompensation for the physiological stimuli. So so if it's overcompensating, it can reduce it, yes. And this is why lower doses tend to be better tolerated than much higher doses. Now, the important thing as I'm talking through this is it's really crucial to look at this as general education only. It's, it's very important not to make decisions or think about medications as having side effects just because I'm mentioning this. It is crucial to discuss these aspects with a medical professional. This may not apply to an individual. This is just an overall sort of insight that I'm providing based on the evidence. So because every medication is a risk benefit analysis. Next, we know that beta blockers result in mast cell degranulation, worsening symptoms of the mast cell activation and mast cell activation POTS that's a subset that's present. Then I often see fludrocortisone, which is a mineral corticoid to increase sort of volume because hypervolume.
hypovolemia is an issue. So that's often prescribed. Next, pyridostigmine is prescribed, which we know pyridostigmine being an cholinesterase inhibitor with increased levels of acetylcholine. What it basically does, it prolongs the phasic effects on acetylcholine on the autonomic ganglia, basically resulting in helping to uh, counteract that excessive sympathetic drive. So acetylcholine, remember, was had innovation on the endothelial. So what it does is it potentiates that effect, counteracting that excessive sympathetic activity. So there is evidence that, again, it can reduce heart rate by doing that. And that's often one of the reasons it's prescribed. So often I'll see mitodrine present, uh, pyridostigmine present, fludrocortisone present, and maybe a beta blocker present. And a lot of these are really working on the periphery to a certain extent, trying to reduce also that central hyperadrenergic state. But let's backtrack to the brain and ask ourselves, well, hold on, we've looked at the periphery, but what is the part of the brain that really controls this excessive hyperadrenergic state from the top? So firstly, what part of the brain controls the autonomic nervous system? Frontal lobe is one, we saw medial prefrontal cortex, but the other one is the limbic system. And in the limbic system, there is a part of the brain known as amygdala. And many of you will know that amygdala is closely linked to fear, aggression, panic, anxiety. This is really the seat of that fight and flight response. So let's take the example of panic attack. We know that the first time there is an exposure to a threat, we have that same sympathetic drive, but that's the amygdala that is linked to the autonomic nervous system and fight and flight response. Sympathetic drive, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, you know, sweating, etc., and we head off, uh, run away from there. So the question here is that we know that panic attacks after a while and panic in panic disorder, they can occur out of the blue. Why does that happen? Because in some cases you see the heart rate increase can trigger off the amygdala response. So it's a bi-directional link that the periphery can trigger off amygdala response, setting up a vicious cycle, or the amygdala can set off the periphery. So the important thing is that the limbic system and the amygdala has to be taken into account overall in treatment as well. So this is the frontal lobe and the limbic system that needs to be taken into account. Secondly, what part of the brain results in the cognitive symptoms? Frontal lobe, right? We looked at the cerebral uh, blood flow and frontal lobe is also closely linked to mood. So in summary, the frontal lobe and the limbic system absolutely need to be taken into account in the overall treatment of chronic fatigue syndrome and ME. And this is where psychiatrists or neuropsychiatrists come into the picture. And this is where a different group of medications come in. For frontal lobe, we're really looking at that dopamine strengthening pathways. And there is a whole range of dopaminergic agents that can do that centrally. Secondly, that central hyperadrenergic state, right? This reduction of the central hyperadrenergic state. We have central sympatholytics that reduce that, such as clonidine, for example, prazosin that we use in, say, post-traumatic stress disorder, where a similar mechanism applies. So it's important to take into account that the amygdala, the limbic system, controls basic autonomic arousal processes. The amygdala innovates the autonomic networks and produces visceral signs of emotional arousal, such as that heart rate increase. So what medications potentially, and again, this is not medical advice, this is a discussion, but often the important aspect is dopaminergic agents. There's a whole range of dopaminergic agents. You might've heard of bupropion. We know stimulants that are used in ADHD. Interestingly, stimulants such as methylphenidate, r modafinil, modafinil are also evidence-based in POTS. Clonidine is also evidence-based in POTS, can actually stabilize the blood pressure. Often there are concerns around drops in blood pressure, but evidence suggests that it can stabilize heart rate and blood pressure in patients with high sympathetic nervous system activity. So we've got stimulants, methylphenidate, dexamphetamine, modafinil, r modafinil. We've got bupropion. We've got agents such as SNRIs that increase noradrenaline, melnasopran. We've got desvanlafaxine, duloxetine, which is duloxetine melnasopran specifically used in fibromyalgia. And then other limbic system reducers. So for example, this is where we have agents that we use for mixed features when limbic system is activated, such as mood stabilizers, such as GABA potentiators, glutamate reducers, mood stabilizers, such as lamotrigine, for example, low dose antipsychotic medications, if it's really at an extreme level. Now, this is the armamentarium that we have that we can use to target specific symptoms centrally, because as we saw that all of this autonomic nervous system, endothelial dysfunction, mast cell activation, etc., dopamine aspects all backtrack to the brain and really localize in that frontal lobe, that limbic system, amygdala sort of aspects that are present. So I'm going to summarize this. We've, we've taken a lot in. I'm sure there's a lot to discuss, but I hope that this has given sort of an understanding of how the body and the brain are closely linked. So firstly, to summarize, we've got endothelium, autonomic nervous systems, POTS closely linked. We've got an underlying central hyperadrenergic state that's present in many, many patients. Second, there is dopamine reduction in the prefrontal cortex. And we know dopamine also plays an important role in endothelial function. 
there is dopamine depletion in the periphery as well, often due to compounding factors such as mast cell activation as well. And dopamine is necessary for prefrontal cortex not only to maintain adequate executive function, cognition, but also to control the limbic system arousal, the autonomic nervous system, and to provide adequate cerebral blood flow as well. Third, the autonomic nervous system is connected to the limbic system, so it's important we can't forget the limbic system in the overall picture. It's important to calm that part of the brain down. So the final message is that a multi-pronged approach is required, addressing central and peripheral aspects. But in the absence of strengthening the frontal lobe, calming that limbic system down, and only looking at the periphery, it's sometimes difficult to get that full traction or outcomes, optimal outcomes, in treating patients with chronic fatigue syndrome or ME. At milder ends, of course, a range of things can work. But as I mentioned, my insights are derived from seeing patients that have come to see me after eight to 10 years. So a multi-pronged approach, a multidisciplinary team is necessary, you know, sort of bring all those thoughts together and to have a strategic approach to implement this. If you stayed till the end, you know, a big thank you listening to it all the way to the end. And if you liked the video, of course, give us a like, do leave your comments in the comment section. Let me know what else your insights are with regards to this really complex condition. I look forward to seeing you in another edition soon in another video in the near future. Until then, take care and stay safe. Bye-bye. Synthesizing complex material in psychiatry to simplify your practice.